wanted to start by asking you how you and your colleagues became interested in this topic of, of first generation students. In 2002, I started a longitudinal study of a cohort of uh, UC Santa Cruz students. And what I was really interested in there was what, you know, people talk about underrepresented students, so ethnic minorities without a college going experience. And so what I wanted to look at is what's different from them and students who have a long history of college going. So in this case, uh, Caucasian and Asian students. And the reason I wanted to look at that is because, you know, we say a lot about the challenges, but some of the challenges are just about going to college and leaving home. As a result of that study, and the students are now in their 30s, um, I noticed that some of the students um, were actually the first in their families to go to college and they were different from the other ethnic minority students um, in that, um, at least in the UC, the minority students um, tended to be at that time uh, kids of educated parents. And so I was really interested in what happens when um, your parents don't have the college knowledge. And the reason for this is that a lot of my work has been with adolescents who are immigrants and their parents, basically their, their parents are less skilled in English and many times by the time the kids are going to middle school, they have more education than their parents. And so I really was interested in continuing that. And that's what got me interested in first generation uh, college students, which are really an increased demographic. And so for example, at um, UC Santa Cruz, it's 42%. Um, and, um, and, and, and especially in California, you have you know, very high rates of college going, low income. And so I was really interested in Okay, so what are we going to do to understand where they're coming from, but also to make sure they graduate? Because it's not just getting them at risk, it's actually getting them to graduate. Tell me a little bit about your uh, most recent study. The most recent study that we did uh, was a collaboration with Paul Hastings at UC Davis and his students and my students. And what we were, um, my real passion is identity development and close relationships. And so what we were, um, looking at is how do students who are the first in their families to go to college coordinate family relationships, friends from home and school, and academics in a context in which, particularly at this political moment, there's a lot of prejudice and discrimination. And so um, uh, Paul does a lot of biomarkers of stress measures um, and uh, so it was great a collaboration because often when I talk to students, they'll tell me about you know, your everyday experiences and they'll talk about something really horrible, and say, but it's fine, dealt with it. And with these, <laughs> take, taking uh, blood pressure and uh, saliva for cortisol, you, know, you get a sense that not really, you know, so you're still stressed. And the reason that you're talking to me is because you have good coping skills, but I also become a person that's listening. And so we um, uh, looked at 200 of these students uh, and what we were looking for is we were also interested in, are your experiences different depending on what you're thinking of majoring in? Uh, so uh, social sciences, uh, STEM, <laughs> arts, and the reason for that is that for a lot of first generation students, all they've heard since they were little is the only way to make it in this country is to be in STEM, right? Many of them are not interested in STEM or they've gone to high schools that did not prepare them well enough. And so they come into the university and they crash their first quarter. Common for a lot of first generation students, but especially in STEM, if you flunk some of those courses, you're off step, you're out. And so, um, so we're really interested in what are the experiences and why is it that students who are in these majors, in it, if you just ignore for a moment academic preparation, are not doing as well and are dropping out or are migrating to other majors. Um, and so that, that's what we uh, looked at. How many students did you look at at this particular case? Uh, for this particular stu uh, study, it was 200 and about 60% um, are female. Uh, when you look at first gens, often you have more females than males because a lot of the young, younger men, uh, um, if they're ethnic minorities, are more likely to drop out of high school. And, and the girls are also, women, are more likely to persist in college. And so you get, begin to get these disbalances. So yeah, about 200 and we had um, 50 at each in first year, second year, third year, and fourth year. Um, can you tell me what some of the biggest 
uh, obstacles are for these students? Most first-generation college students uh, come from low-income homes. And so one of the biggest challenges that they have is financial. Uh, because many of them have support, but what they're actually doing is they feel a little bit guilty because they have housing, they have food, if they have, you know, if they've gotten scholarships and they're in the dorms, and they are doing, living better than their families. And so often what they will do is they will so, send part of their scholarship money or part of the money, part of their work money back home. And so then they get into challenged situations when they are moving off campus or whatever. The second um, challenge, of course, is poor academic preparation of many. Uh, that uh, it's common, you know, for students that get into a UC uh, to feel like, oh my God, I was such a stellar person uh, in my high school, and here I'm just one of the few. But if you came from an under-resourced high school, it's even more of a challenge, because you might, many of the, for example, many of them didn't have, even have APs, or you're one of a handful of students who went to college. That's totally different. Uh, some of them, you know, of, of the people who are more um, from college-going families, come with friends, right? So, oh, I'm gonna, and, and at least you have familiar. A lot of these other kids come on their own. Um, the other challenge that they have is that they feel as they move through college that they're becoming different people. And so that they're almost having to change out of their skin when they go home because they have to change their diction because otherwise people think they're putting on airs. They're, in general, uh, young people's thinking becomes more liberal when they go, go to college and that's complicated. Um, our campus and, and other campuses because often these people come from um, uh, more conservative towns or cities or families uh, are doing a lot of sexual identity exploration. Uh, so that's a challenge. Um, the other challenge is that a lot of these students um, are in college because they had teachers behind them, administrations behind them. I mean, they really had excellent mentoring. They think that once they come to the university, it's gonna be the same. And it's very difficult for undergraduate students, particularly in the large majors, to find a mentor right away. And so they're feeling like, nobody cares about me, right? Uh, and so feeling lonely and at the same time feeling, what am I doing this when you know, I could have been home or whatever is really challenging. Um, and the final thing that happens is that they feel prejudice and discrimination even though nobody might be doing anything directly. So for example, you walk into a classroom and you're the only person of color or you're the only woman who's also of color. You know, these are really challenging because you begin, and then you, know, you begin to think like, oh my goodness, you know, do I really belong here? Or people will do microaggressions kinds of things where I was like, oh my goodness, you, your English is so good. Well, I grew up in the United States, right? <laughs> Uh, and so those kinds of things really affect people's sense of wanting to uh, be here. And it's a difficult political moment because it's not just, I mean, the university is just a bubble of what's happening. Others, we have, a, you know, DACA students, for example, are really constantly nervous and worried. And of course, at the, as a result of that, it's a big challenge. What can parents do who are watching their students? What can they do to support them? In most cases, the parents provide a tremendous amount of emotional support. They're proud of them, and that almost becomes a burden because if you're having a tough time, you don't want to call because then your parents will worry. Or <laughs> this also happens in that people will say, oh my God, you know, I, you know, mom, I don't have any friends. You know, people are being mean to me. I don't know how to do office hours. And the parents will say, that's not your focus. You're focused on school, right? <laughs> You know, what are you doing with all these other problems? Why are you having fun? It's supposed to be about studying. And so I think that for uh, students to find that balance of how to uh, talk to their families about something they have no experience with, right? Uh, at, and at the same time, finding that support beyond, I'm so proud of you, is important. Where should students look for well, that support? The, uh, things that I would, um, advise them to do is to look at their uh, student services. You know, for example, they often uh, are members of educational opportunity programs, which is a federal program. And, and if they're transfer students to the transfer unit, to see if they have a college culture seminar, right? 
because even just how do you navigate college? What does it mean? Um, I would look for them to make connections with their TAs, teaching assistants, um, because professors can be scary, but the teaching is, it, it is. I mean, even if you think you're not, you know, and so just even learning how to do an office hours is really important uh, because I think that a lot of uh, first generation students think that unless they have like a burning question that's going to change the world, they shouldn't go to office hours or they don't really understand the material, it's their fault. The reality is that if they don't really understand the material, that's when they should go, right? Because that's what we're there for, to help them. Well, that's where the TA is there to help them with rather than feeling like, oh, if I ask for help, that means that somebody's going to say, you see, you don't belong here. And often the person saying that is them, right? Nobody else is saying that. So that would be a tip. Um, the other is to um, join an organization, a club um, that is ethnic based, that is a lot of uh, service based because a lot of the first gen students are used to doing community service and want to go to college to give back. Well, look about what's available because there you will meet people and you will meet and they will mentor you. And so then you will be get, able to get resources. Um, and so I think that those are things that I would, um, that there's help, but that part of it, navigating a university is to know where to go and to feel like you deserve it. In my classes, I have a variety of students, right? And some of the requests that you get from students are like, what? You know, like, I missed class. Did I miss something important? Can I go? That's never a first generation college student, right? And so the first generation college students have to get to that point of saying, you know, I'm having a really tough time. Can I have an extension? I need to talk. You know, and so I think that that sort of um, initiative is something that's very hard to do because it's not just a matter of knowledge, but it's also a matter of hierarchy. Often first gens come from more hierarchical cultures. And so again, just the fact that you could talk to your professors like, whoa, and so I think that those are the tips that, um, um, that I, should, I would give. What would you advise students and their families to do to help support those first generation students? Well, first of all, to connect with their college counselors, and that can be difficult because especially in the public high schools, the counselors have a big burden, right, of students. Because there's scholarships, there's financial aid. By all means, figure out when that FAFSA deadline is and fill it out, right? And to understand that Pell Grants are, are loans. They're not for free, right? And, and so that, that would be one, one thing to do. The other, um, again, would be to connect um, with student services because, for example, um, um, there are food pantries. There are uh, psychological services. There's medical services. But if you don't know that that's there, then it's challenging. Every campus has emergency service for students that has to do with you know housing, food. And I think that um, if you take advantage of those, it will help you a little bit. Um, apply for, uh, for um, positions you know, uh, on campus. And at first you might not succeed because you're a fresh person, but over time uh, you will be eligible. Volunteer positions, if you're really good, they might hire you, right? Um, don't be afraid to work on the dining hall because those always are. So again, sort of these kinds of uh, financial things. But the other thing um, that I would say is, um, you know, be careful of how much debt you get into because you don't have the cushion of more wealthy students that they can ask for parents' support, right? So it's really going to be on your own. And the other advice that I would give is, if you're working full time and going to college full time, you're gonna burn out and you're gonna get sick and it's not gonna be worth it. Uh, and so find ways to um, not burn the candle at both ends. Um, those would be tips that I would do financially. Do you have a percentage on how many first generation students step off a campus in that first year? Whether you're first gen or not, uh, most dropouts are after the first year, right? Don't come back for your second year. Uh, but for your uh, first generation college students, uh, that's a big dropout, but it's all, often, it's sometimes even the first quarter or semester, right? Um, and so uh, I would say um, 
and it depends on the ethnic group. If you're African American uh, and Native American, it's going to be much higher than if you're Latino. Uh, so I would say maybe um, 20%. Uh, and most of them uh, is not because of academic difficulties. They actually tend to do better. Uh, it is because they feel like they don't belong. And so it's a social aspect. Uh, the rates, Cindy, are not as different. The issue is more, will you graduate in four years? Okay, and so the longer you wait, the, the least likely that you graduate in most first, well not much, but a lot of them are going fifth and sixth year, and so they never finish their degrees. So that's you know the first year, but also sort of if you don't finish in four, the likelihood that you will finish really drops dramatically. Is there anything I didn't ask you, Margarita, that you would want to make sure that people know? I think that uh, first-generation students are very different from each other. I think we tend to sort of think of all of them as a group. And I think that if we really looked at them, just like we look at other students, like people who need support, who have just a desire for college, who have parents rooting for them, regardless of what they know that they're doing, um, I think that uh, we do a lot better because the numbers are increasing and they are the future. And, and so they are, in, in a way, the emblematic American dream, right? That your uh, education is the key. And many of them have come through such difficult situations. Well, their parents have suffered, you know, so they're they're agricultural workers. They're just because they want their kids to succeed and they deserve a chance. And I think that all of these students, what impresses me is their desire, their good moral sense. I mean, oh, they want to give back. It's not that they're doing it for them. It's for their families. It's for the community. It's for people in their high school to realize it's possible. And that is something that you don't see a lot in terms of we tend to think of people who are doing it in the United States for themselves, they're not doing it for themselves. They're doing it for everybody. And they, uh, sometimes that is a big burden, and sometimes it's what gives them hope and persistence.